aspirin in aspirin pills aren't actually aspirin. They're actually the conjugate base to aspirin. The reason why is that aspirin by itself is pretty much insoluble. And what are one of the ways you can take aspirin? Yes, by dissolving it in water and drinking it. And by the way, you can make it soluble by taking off the hydrogen and making it charged. Bada bing, bada boom, the whole thing becomes soluble. And when you take it, it slips down through your stomach, the acid turns it back to normal, and now it's easy for your stomach and your intestines to absorb. That's the end of the video. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Well, I'm just kidding. This is an educational channel after all, so it's natural that we overanalyze and explain everything. So first off, let's put ourselves in the shoes of chemists designing aspirin. There are a number of important questions that definitely need to be answered. For example, how do we know how much aspirin is converted back to normal when it goes to the tummy? It could easily be the case that the pH isn't the right amount and you would need to consume more aspirin to meet the dosage requirements. That would probably be a very bad waste of aspirin. Not only that, but since we're going to be dissolving it in water, the pH of the water could be altered. And by how much exactly? We're not sure, right? That's why in this episode, we're going to be dedicating our time not only to just designing the acid-based strength of organic molecules, but also quantifying the mess that is acid-based reactions. By the end of this video, we'll be answering the two questions. What is the pH of a solution of aspirin pills? And how much aspirin is actually usable in a pill after it's consumed? So watch the end to find out. Let's get started. By the way, I'll also assume that you understand equilibrium concepts like the equilibrium constant big K from general chemistry as well before we begin this video. So if you're not sure about that, please revise this. It will be used so often in this video. I think a good starting point in quantifying acids and bases would be to ask how strong are acids and bases? And I think a good starting point would be pH. We've all learned about pH in school. If it's an acid, the pH is less than 7. If it's a base, then it's above 7. And water has a pH of 7. If the acid is strong, then the pH is like 1 to 2, even 0. And weak acids hover around 3 to 6, something like that. Things are pretty similar for bases as well. For example, most of you all have learned in high school have definitely taken a universal indicator strip and tested out the strength of, say, hydrochloric acid and got a reading of like 1 to 2. pH would be a good way of classifying how strong an acid is until you actually dig into what pH actually is. Remember when I said we consume the conjugate base of aspirin? Let me elaborate on what conjugate base actually is. Let's make this picture a little more general, a little more abstract. A conjugate base is an acid that's already reacted, it's already given its hydrogen away. Similarly, a conjugate acid of the pre is the acid of the previous base, and these two can come back together to react back to give the same thing you started with. As you can see, the acid is what gives the hydrogen away in both cases. This is the bronsted lowry definition of acids and bases. And the pH tells you how much of the hydrogen ion, H+, is floating around in the solution. Or if you're in water, it's H3O+. More specifically, pH is the negative log base 10, or log in this case, of the concentration of H+. The thing with this definition is that if we have hydrochloric acid, a really strong acid in one molar, then we would indeed have a pH of zero. No problem, strong acid, low pH, makes sense. But if we dilute the thing to 10 to negative seven molars, then the pH is seven. It's literally no different from neutral water. So that's why defining an acid strength using pH alone is kind of bogus. Okay, so we've lost some progress, but that's okay, we can build on it. If we dissolve an acid in water, pretty much the way you think it would happen, just dump the acid in water, this actually generates an acid-base reaction, since water itself can be both an acid or a base depending on the situation. In our case, water would now act as a base and the resulting products will be the hydronium H3O plus 
and the conjugate base. For this reaction to happen, the bond between hydrogen and the A molecule has to break. If the acid lets go of this bond easier, the more products we can generate, right? Since there will be more hydrogen present around in the solution. I think this definition is much better than the last. It doesn't care how much of the molecule there is, but cares about what H is bonded to, which is, you know, intrinsic to the molecule. Well, that's good and all, but how do we quantify those statements? We can go two routes here, either look at the energy stored in the bond or look at the equilibrium of the reaction. For this video, we'll go to the equilibrium route, but in a later episode, we'll definitely come back for the fusion of both routes. Let's set up the equilibrium here. We gather up the HGO since it's a liquid phase and not an aqueous phase. And I think this equilibrium constant is a good way to put our definition for acid strength. Why? Because it doesn't really depend on how much of the things are present, but it rather controls how much of everything is present. Ka it, more than 1 means that the acid is strong, more of the product since the fraction is going to be top heavy. However, a Ka of less than 1 means the fraction is going to be bottom heavy and favors the reactants you began with. So here's a neat trick you can do to this expression equation here. You see this hydronium ion? You can actually move that to the other side Take the negative log of base 10 and you get pH. Now after some algebra tricks, you see on the right hand side, we have this expression here. We'll write negative log of Ka as new quantity called pKa. It's essentially pH but applied to Ka. The reason why we do this is that Ka values actually can vary very wildly, say from 10 to negative 10 to 10 to the 15, something like that. The numbers are very, very, very large in range. So that's why we log the entire thing to make the values more compact. Treat pKa as a scoring system. The lower you score, the weaker your bond is, hence the more acidic you are. So low pKa, high acidity, high pKa, low acidity. And after some rearrangements, this equation is called the henderson hasselbalch equation. And to interpret this equation, think of it as a way to relate pH to the strength of your acid, the pH of the solution, that is. Higher acid strength, hence lower pKa, means you're going to wind up with a low pH. But that is affected by how much of the acid or conjugate base you have floating around in the solution. If you have more conjugate base, then your pH is going to get higher than the pKa. And the opposite is true if you have more acid. Another way to neatly interpret pKa is that when the concentration of both the acid and the conjugate base is equal, then pH becomes equal to pKa. So pKa also tells you the pH in which everything is nice and equal. And this relationship is definitely going to be useful to us solving the second question. However, say we're adding a base to water instead. Can, we can't really use Ka to determine the strength of the base, can we? So what we can do instead is set up an equilibrium, almost the same way we did with the acids earlier. And we just call the constant Kb. Yes, we can stop there. But measuring and determining Kb and pKb along with pKa is a whole separate setup, you know, with different reagents and everything. In fact, there's only data for pKa on aspirin, but I couldn't find the pKb of the conjugate base. This is definitely going to be an issue solving the first problem. But there's a little neat fact though, it's that pKa added with the value of pKb adds up to 14. And so does pH and pOH. I won't go into further detail since we're already this deep into the video, but this is due to the fact that all of this happens in water. And here's a quick animation for those who are more curious about this topic. And pKa is determined experimentally, so you'd actually use a lookup table like this one. However, having a table like this kind of begs the question further. 
if we wound up in a situation where we don't have the data for a molecule, how in the world do we at least estimate or compare the strength of acids and bases? So what makes an acid strong? Let's look at back at the reaction. The bond being very loose also implies something else. It also means that the conjugate base has to be stable. If it's not stable, then it would try to go back to something else that's more stable. And this is one of the core principles of not only just organic chemistry or acid-base chemistry, but chemistry as a whole. Things like to spread out and lower its energy as much as possible. So instead of trying to haphazardly figure out how strong the bond between hydrogen and the acid is, we can do the alternative and look at how stable the conjugate base is. So let's make use of what I've just said. Things like to spread out as much as possible, and the thing in our case is an electron with a charge conjugate base. If the molecule can spread out its charges or lower its energy or accommodate as many electrons as possible, then it's quite stable, making it a worse base and a better acid. Now, let's look at the four ways in which this can happen. When we think of electrons in chemistry, electronegativity definitely comes to mind. Say, if you're asked to compare these two molecules, an amine and an alcohol, which is more acidic? Then the alcohol is more acidic. Since the worst conjugate bases make the better acids, let's take a look at the conjugate bases and see why. Both of these elements are electronegative, meaning they're quite happy, therefore stable, handling electrons. However, oxygen is better at it doing this job. Therefore, the more stable conjugate base is from the alcohol, making the alcohol more acidic than the amine. And as you can see, this is true from the pKa values. So say now you know the pKa of one form of the molecule and not the other, you can accurately know that at the very least, the amine form is going to be less acidic than the alcohol form. There's also another property, polarizability. Even though, as you can see here, sulfur is less electronegative than oxygen, the pKa is smaller for the sulfur. The reason why is because sulfur is a bigger atom than oxygen, so it can have more surface area to spread the charge over itself. Hence, the bigger the molecule, the more stable. So, if you were to add fluorine, or any halogen really, to the end of this acid, you actually see that the pKa goes down like a lot. The reason why is that even though there's not resonance between the two regions at all, there's no sharing of electrons, the electronegativity of the fluorine has a strong enough pull that electrons actually spend a little more time closer to the molecule, making the bond really, really flimsy, or in other words, the ion is really stable. Well, last but not least, if you're trying to spread out the electrons as much as possible, you can't forget what we just learned about last week, resonance. If we just took our aspirin molecule and take a look at it, you can see that the resonance actually spreads out almost the entirety of the molecule. So that makes it kind of a good acid. Say, if you compare it to something that has less resonance, like benzoic acid, less spread of electrons over the molecule, you see that it's actually a worse acid. So when you're designing your acids and bases in the future, these would definitely be the tools you can use to raise or lower the pKa of your molecules. But now, let's move back to our problem. We're ready to solve it. So our first question, what's the pH of the small glass of dissolved aspirin? So I'll make a few assumptions. I'll assume we're dissolving a tablet 75 milligrams worth of aspirin in 100 mils of water, which is approximately 0.004 molars, and that there's nothing in the water before we dissolve it. When we dissolve the conjugate base in water, some of it is definitely going to change into aspirin and the hydroxide ion, as we've seen in the KB section. We don't know how much yet though, so let's just say we use up X of the conjugate base. 
And since one conjugate base makes one of the products each, the x of the conjugate base being subtracted will also make x added to each of the products. So in total, we lost x from 0 0.004 molars of conjugate base and gained x for both products. The constraint on the value of x is that it has to fit this ratio kb when all the dust of the chemical reaction settles. But since we already know the pKa, we gotta start from there. Get the pKa, subtract it from 14 to get the pKb, exponentiate the pKb to get the Kb, and now we solve for x. Now, let's remind ourselves, why is x exactly? It's the amount of the products we gained. And one of our products is OH minus. And from that point, we can use the concentration of the OH to find the pH using the 14 rule again. So we find the pOH first by negative logging the entire thing, subtract it all from the 14, 14 rule, remember, and bada bing bada boom, we find the pH to be around 7.5. Pretty safe to drink. On to the second problem. Now, let's find out how much of the aspirin will be useful in our stomach. In this case, we would leverage the henderson hasselbalch equation. We know the pKa and we know the pH, so find the ratios of the forms of aspirin would be pretty easy and straightforward, considering that it's literally written right there in the equation. But what we have is the ratio between A minus and AH, which is not what we're after. What we're actually after is how much of the aspirin we get per everything we added in, meaning both the conjugate base and the acid form of aspirin. Or in other words, what percentage of aspirin that's usable. So after a little bit of algebra, we find that around 81% of the aspirin will be active. Not bad, we answered both our questions. So what did we learn in this episode? We learned about how to use numbers to quantify how strong acids are, and that's pKa. We learned the counterpart of pKa, that is pKb, and that both of them add up to 14. And that's by knowing about the equilibrium of water. We learned also how to alter the pKa of organic chemicals by electronegativity, polarizability, inductive effects, and resonance. And now we've used all that knowledge to solve our problem that we began with, with the issues regarding aspirin. And now you can see that by quantifying acids and bases, we can start solving real world problems. So let's expand that thought process to the entirety of chemistry, since we've just seen how useful quantification can be. So next week, we'll be getting into thermodynamics, where we'll be taking chemistry and pretty much quantifying all of it. Not only are we going to be able to solve the real world problems, but one key insight thermodynamics is going to give is whether a reaction can happen or not. And that's going to be in exact numbers as well. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll see you next week. Goodbye.